Welcome back. Rhetoric Warriors podcast. Man, we've been off the air for a while, but now we're back and I've got a jackhammer next door. So that should be interesting. You never know. We're back with Dr. Dave Payne, uh, emeritus professor. And uh, I'm Dr. Dan. I don't know what I am these days. Cruise ship comedian, rhetorician, software rhetorician guy. Rhetorician at large. <laughs> rhetorician at large. I'm just trying to live, I'm just trying to, you know, stay relevant in the age of chat GPT. You're a message so, man. Yeah, so we're going to talk today about, though, uh, the rhetoric of justice. Because I have keep running into this in so many variations. And it's the Trump trials have begun. You know, the age of the Trump trials. He's actually being pulled now into courtrooms right and left. Uh, and then there's the reaction over here of, well, how do we get the Bidens into Trump, into trials? You know, and, and so it's everything's now moving over into a world of justice. So we're going to talk today about the rhetoric of justice. OK, I'll try. All right. It's not something I have a pre-existing category for. So this is this is fun. So. Well, I think most people don't. Right. Everybody has this. The word justice is dominant. It's a dominant word in the world, but people don't really ever sit down and break it apart, which is the thing that always fascinates me about rhetoric is that it forces you to break it apart if you're going to do right. any work on it. And so like even if you start with some kind of a definition of justice, right? Basic rhetorical move, let's define it. Justice versus injustice. And America has been bathed in injustice, political injustice now, for, you know, coming up on what? Six, eight years with Trump? Okay. Um, Just that well, I, feeling of being in an era of injustice. So, so, so the idea that that Trump must be brought to justice. You mean the sort of the 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 life of that sense that something unjust is going on? Um, well, the sense that we we can see it right there. You can see the nefarious forces, and nobody is calling them to task. Nobody's able to get at them and and bring justice to that moment. Okay. Uh, well, I think that I think that's a that's a slice. Okay, that that there are people who feel as though him getting by with stuff, you know, uh, defiles uh, justice, and um, and and they're looking for it. So so that that institutional quality are, are the the institutions of justice on both sides, right? Uh, never before has the integrity of of the judiciary. Uh, right, the justice system been challenged the way it's being challenged now. Right, that's just because uh, of of its attempt to get at Trump as much right. as any basic authoritarian playbook. Right, to corrupt uh, all the institutions, but you definitely have to corrupt the justice institutions because they're the ones that can get at you. Right, and I, and I think just sort of a parking lot kind of uh, observation. Uh, I think the word corruption coming up in the conversation is important. Right. Um, I was in a, I, I don't want to re retrace too many steps, but I was in a conversation recently about sort of the, the, you know, and it was an intergenerational thing about our sense of where we're at as a country and political division. Um, and the, the thing that kind of was a moment of uh, all hovered around, we just believe there's so much corruption. This was, this is their anxiety about justice as well as, I mean, what, what is the just, as well as truth. Um, you know, which, 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 so being on one side or another is kind of paralyzed by the sense that they're both corrupt, the whole system is corrupt, and I think that is kind of the springboard of, of Trumpism to start with. Uh, not just the sense of personal injustice that um, the, the, the uh, MAGA types um, uh, brought as their warrant for Trump, who, who defies, right, all, both, both Democrat and Republican and, you know, historical. Because I think one of the warrants there was Clinton's and Bush's are just part of the same, right, hypocrisy, same corruption. Uh, and this is what we're trying to get something authentic uh, from the outside, something, some, some, you know. So they're, they're actually looking for some sense of justice, that, that um, whether that be based on uh, a kind of a blue collar people have been abandoned, the Rust Belt people have been abandoned, right? 
uh, by uh, uh, contemporary politics in Washington. So there is that sense of injustice that brings us to this moment to start with. And then on the other, you know, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the counter move of, um, well, right, not, not only the, the, that this is worse than, um, but, that, but that the justice systems need to be able to handle this, right, the, the, the kind of, so where, where does one, so I, I think one could successfully argue that uh, the part, the, a lot of the appeal of Trump and Trumpism that defies our logic, that defies our um, mores, our, our sense of right, whatever on one side, um, uh, is in fact that, that, that he brings a sense of justice to, to uh, some people. Yeah, isn't that so? That's the the malleability of justice, and so the, it's a football in the middle of this mess somewhere, right? It, it's crazy, like, and it and it goes across all settings. So, you know, financial justice, you know, with capitalism versus socialism, you know, which is a just system, which doles out the right amount of, you know, justice or injustice to the wealthy. You're seeing that a lot now with sort of the fights of the unions to get back in the game. You know, versus the uber wealthy, which is the old robber barons, right? You know, it's it's those stories have come back up, and it's it's a justice story at at almost every level, like societal justice, like for all the down groups, any group that's been you know suppressed and abused by the major powers has this justice rhetoric of we're now seeking justice for what you've done to us. Oh, okay, well, uh, yeah, the whole reparations and and all of that. But uh, but but just to once again put on our, our chart here, uh, uh, the whole social justice is, is a god term, right? Uh, of the whole left, uh, countered on the other side by the anti woke reaction, right? So uh, there could be a personal social, right? Social justice is itself a a, 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 a shibboleth uh, of sorts uh, for the left. And a, and a target for suspicion by the right. Yeah, and it did, but it lines up so well as two big armies now, right? Of social justice warriors over here and conservative pres preservationists over here. And you've got the preservation of the mythology of the past, and you've got the, you know, uh, the glory of the future we could have if we would only, you know, over here on the societal justice side. And they just, line up again and again and again across settings, it seems like. Well, one thing that kind of pops up in the midst of all this is just uh, uh, identity politics and, and justice somehow having a connection that, right? Because um, that seems to me to be part of the, you know, the opposition between the social justice movement and the, um, uh, the, the counter movement there. Well, yeah, and if you if your injustice is strong enough, and I think this is what's happened to a lot of the younger generations that they've been they've been drugged through so many scenarios of injustice, all the way from racial, you know, the you know um, the racial movement to the feminist movement to all the different movements, all the different down group movements, the gender group, that it's just injustice, 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 and that becomes such a strongly ingrained rhetoric that we are here to counter that injustice. And it becomes a defining element in, in those generations, it seems like. Uh, in the sense that that's not fair. Where's my justice, right? Sure. In, in the middle of all this. Yeah, and, and so when you're back out of that and you're like, okay, well, do you deserve justice? Like, what does that mean? Like you start getting into the rhetorics of, Hey, there's 500 groups that have been oppressed. Which one are we going to seek justice for? I've watched a few documentaries along the way about, you know, like South American tra uh, traditional tribes and indigenous people just being wiped out, like within the modern context, not the old, you know, just roll in as a colonialist power and kill everybody. They're still happening. And watching that, the interviews of people that have, that's happened to like the Israel versus Palestine thing right now, it becomes this justice confusion 
because both sides are pulling up those rhetorics and they're so strong. So, so one part of this is justice is supposed to be a basis on which we can make judgments uh, and sort of know where you are. So it, it is an ideal to be pursued in what, you know, and if you think about any law case, there's so many different distracting details and, and trade-offs that, that there is a kind of a, justice is itself a transcendent moment. Okay, what's, what's the right answer? And it's usually, but you know, and our, our system is based on uh, adversarial, right? I, I think that's one of the characteristics of the, of the West is that, that uh, if you look at our, our justice system here, take two sides, and put them, uh, you know, uh, opposed completely in the in extreme, and somehow the the the, the truth slash justice uh, will reside in in the middle somewhere, right? In in the, as a result of this competition, uh, that's already a, a formula for, right? <laughs> when you when you ask something about social justice, when you ask something about generational, justice, when you ask something about, you know, the the, the who 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 is history, all right? How, how can history be fair or how can you make history fair? Uh, uh, so now we're sitting here in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a complete, you know, diametric conflict. And, and is there some process, is there some court where this gets decided where the, where the middle is somehow seized? Uh, and if you look at some of our, our political, you know, I, I listen to reporting constantly and, and that seems to be part of it. Uh, it is the idea that there must there must be some sort of uh, a conversation here where the middle can be received. And if you look at the reporting on elections, that, that seems to be what people are trying to do, right? They're trying to find the middle somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, is that? But is that justice? Like, well, we got you, you know, <clears throat> half of what you wanted. Does that feel like justice? So, and and again, like this becomes so pervasive. So if we take it out of our, our mega theater and shrink it down maybe into some personal application, when you think about things in your own life that have been uh, unjust, that you've, that have happened to you. Like I remember my, my brother, uh, my grandfather was kind of a piece of work. And when he died, he left everything to my little brother that he had for no reason other than he liked to cause trouble. <laughs> it wasn't that my younger brother was his favorite or anything like that. He left him his truck and it wasn't a lot. It was truck and like some fishing gear and things like that, a few things like that. And so like, I remember going, oh, well, clearly my brother is going to reset justice on this and just split it up between the four kids and, you know, move, move back into, um, balance here so it's a just world and he didn't he just kept it all and i'm like oh wow that stings now what do i do with that injustice do i hold that against him does it become a thing in the family because i think it's what my grandfather was trying to do and i'm like mm -hmm. no just let it go. like at least intellectually like just let it go so that that wow. injustice completely disrupts the world and people have to, you know, again, try to get back to, you know, some type of consonance. Well, once again, just sort of taking notes, um, the sense of compensation, right? That, that, the, the, uh, and balance, right? The scales of justice that somehow, and the long memory of, of justice, right? That, that somehow, you know, when we look at the rhetoric surrounding, um, it, it, are the actions of Israel just right now? And all the, the sorting through that uh, we're trying to, uh, you know, what, what, is, what is the memory here of injustice? Is it sort of fueling both sides of the, of the conversation? Um, yeah, how far back do you want to start the conversation, right? Oh, they, they, they pulled and, all the way back to like the Middle Ages I've seen. Sure, sure. Um, as, as did uh, Osama bin Laden uh, after 911. If you recall his uh, message about 911, right? Sure, uh, and Putin now, like, hey, I'm redrawing the maps to sure. 1400s or whatever it is. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, and like and like you and your brother, you know, this this was going to remain an unresolved little, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
evidence of the unfairness of life, right? And we know in, in literature and lore, people can become completely consumed by that and embittered and, and well, never so find a literary and, genre. I mean, yeah, like, so, knives so, out. Like, I, you know, I, I never, I never, I never go for an easy plug. I never go for an easy plug, but when I, I wrote about failure as a, as a dialect between comp compensation and consolation, that which can't be compensated must ultimately be consoled, right? <laughs> uh, and those are two separate kinds of rhetorical frames that may address the same problem yeah. over and over and over and over again. You may For see sure. consolation or transcendence of your of your grandfather's uh, uh, injustice here, but it never quite goes away. It's never quite made made whole again, right? Right, and that's and again, like you said, this plays out, you know, in so many ways. I remember with the Louis C.K. thing, um, you know, he he had a couple of sins. His first sin was exposing himself to sort of, you know, these women he was working with that didn't, you know, have any power. The second sin was covering it up when he got caught and accusing them of lying. And then third sin was just the continued, you know, sense of I'm not going to apologize for this. And, and then when he did try to do that and he didn't offer the victims any comp compensation, you know, almost no consolation, which are, you know, you would think, I'm more worth a hundred million dollars. I'll throw these, these, you know, yeah. people a couple million dollars and everyone will be like, yeah, that's fair for, you know. No framework for repair. Absolutely. It's interesting. Well, that does, that, that, that comes in nicely with your stuff about, um, you know, repair and, and the, the getting back from failure because injustice is a failure of society, right? It's a failure of humanity. Or it can, it can even be more cosmological, right? Just sort of, you know, the way things are. <laughs> right. Or how did God let this injustice happen? You know, and that really, ultimately, that's why religion has such a, an advantage, right? Because it's got a supernatural sphere where all this will be reset. And those who have, you know, perpetrated injustice will pay. Well, right. The, the, well, or, or the, the whole notion of redemption, that the suffering in life will be repaid in, 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 the, in the next life, right? Uh, so... Uh, that, that's a, that's an interesting. Mm. Uh, I thought of that a second ago when uh, one of my friends is knows a lot of theology, but she's uh, Jewish, but but deep sort of into the the, the sense of that uh, and the history of that. Um, but uh, it was an education for me in talking with her that uh, one might ask or a Christian might ask. I don't know if this is a good typification, but um, why me? But the, the the person of faith, right, the Hebraic person, will say, "Why not me? Why wouldn't this be me?" Right, as as being selected for the uh, the injustice of the world. So, uh, two fundamentally different orientations, right? Well, there's so many there, there's so many sub roles that have to be played in the justice game, right? Who is going to decide? Who's going to evaluate this as justice or injustice? and the amount of justice and injustice, and then who's going to decide the compensation or the, you know, the, the reaction that is fair and not fair. And again, going back to, you know, the Israel-Palestine thing right now, like, is this an overreaction? Um, but people don't even know what it's really reacting to. Is this a series of rocket attacks? You know, I'm, and but is that a reaction to the way, you know, Palestine has been treated for the last 70 years? And it just starts growing a tree of decisions that you have to evaluate. And ultimately, how do you how do you get to uh, a clean enough system of this is just and this is not that you can decide what should be done now? Right. Well, you know, I, I guess when there is no court of redress here, I mean, and that's what that's what the justice system, the justice system doesn't necessarily ever produce perfect you know, we just all agree to the resolution, right? Um, it's kind of like ultimate mediation here, right? In, in a divorce. Nobody's going to wind up being happy or think that the right answer was achieved, but there's a point at which you, you, you realize that the continued conflict is, is more costly than, right, whatever was lost. I mean, that, that's kind of ultimately the deal we make. And when we're talking about, you know, historical conflicts of this sort, um, that's that's you know, looking at the raised villages of, of Ukraine and then seeing the same imagery with Gaza, uh, you know, I, I can't help, I can't keep those in completely separate frames of what's right and wrong or, or justice or injustice. 
uh, they both seem, you know, uh, terribly tragic and and uh, a loss that we shouldn't be suffering. Um, at any rate, um, those are those are never going to be compensated. They're only going to be maybe ideally uh, rebuilt. But at this point in time, nobody can even see that moment. So <clears throat> that those things aren't going to go away. There's just some point at which resolution. So I guess what I'm saying between countries. Uh, are, are between factions even we're talking you know there, there's uh, uh, there's so much right now in the you know uh, United States that people are people are saying that you know civil war is the only possible way that we can do this um, wow <laughs> right <clears throat> well and I guess that's the promise of things like the institutionality of justice Right. So that you create a court system, you create a political system between warring factions, you create people that are expert mediators, some way of coming in the middle into the middle of this incredible mess. Because as soon as things start happening, like like war, especially the amount of injustice happening to innocent bystanders and people over here and unintended friendly fire. And you're like, oh, my God. You know, it's so complicated and there's so much of it that you have to have some kind of formal institution for controlling it, at least where people can come together without it still dominating. Right. But there is, there is no system of justice. I mean, we see that the UN can make statements, but um, there is no system of resolution outside of the, the, the actors themselves uh, uh, and the emergence of conflict. Now, you know, once again, there are, there are models of, of social drama where how do we resolve conflicts, you know, um, where we come to crisis and then, and then uh, reproach and whatever. Uh, but like a divorce, there is also, you know, once again, justice gets lost somewhere along the way, which doesn't mean there isn't a rhetoric of justice constantly tit for tat all the way through it. Right. Well, the Stacking rhetoric up, of justice keeps it the rhetoric of Joyce just it keeps it boiling, right? It's like every time you turn down the heat, you can turn it back up with injustice. Sure. I was watch, I watched that um, the Nuremberg trial movie with Spencer Tracy fairly right. recently. Right. Whatever, whatever it was called, because it was called Nuremberg, and um, it was so ham-handed. And it's you know we got to make everybody these guys so evil. And then they had the one, you know, Burt Lancaster, who was kind of, you know, in the middle, like he had all these great things about him, but he still did these and trying to find some sense of justice for everybody through that movie, you know, where the prosecuting attorney kind of loses his mind at some point. It's like, how dare you? And the judge always sitting there and learning to empathize with the Germans, but ultimately holding them to task for what they did. But I'll try to watch it as like, okay, I see what you're trying to do. But again, everything's invading the moment. You know, how do you give justice to everybody in the scene? Right, right. Well, and, and once again, the whole, you know, from the Germans orientation, the, the, the whole thing began at a, a huge sense of injustice about World War I. Right. And a sense of corruption, right? That they're, that they're right. Um, so those were, <laughs> those were the themes. Well, pull it down. What, what, a, mess, in your what life. a mess it is. <laughs> find, find an injustice in your life and tell me about it. <laughs> me personally? Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a good lady. I'm, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't want to go there right now at the moment. I'm not prepared for that. So. You don't have anything like, uh, like just driving down the street, there's injustice all over the place, right? <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I prefer to kind of uh, think that uh, in the big picture, you know, no, no uh, generation, no, no people uh, had, a, had a better time of it. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, you missed the war, right? You weren't in the war. Sure, sure. Um, no, I mean, Vietnam, no, I, I did not go to Vietnam. I was... Uh, uh, just in, I was in the first draft uh, lotto, right? But uh, got a decent number and was a college student. So, but uh, yeah. Well, you were in academics forever. Talk about some injustice rolling around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, no, it's more like displaced uh, idealism, I think, more more tarnished idealism than than uh, justice has never been a particularly big frame. I mean, I think, yeah, there were there were unjust decisions. There were there were things uh, along the way, sure, uh, things that weren't fair. Uh, evaluate. I mean, think about it. It's a, it's a culture of evaluation. So, my God, yeah, everybody everybody in there is thinking that. In a just world, my students would love me and my research would be considered, you know, the most important thing in the world. So I think everybody carries that, that uh, sense around with them. But uh, this is all small potatoes when it comes to the, the to think that, to have a job like that and to be able to make a living by thinking and talking. Wow. What a, what a great, what a great blessing that was. Yeah. And I, I, I tend to roll through different um, you know, ecologies, environments all the time. And so like in entertainment, think about the, the injustices of entertainment. I remember when I first started to stand up and there was a guy who owned the comedy club in Louisville, which had a really good community around of maybe 100, 150, you know, um, people who wanted to do stand up and they were different levels of experience and talent. But this is back during the late eighties when stand up was really hot and there was a lot of money in it. So he would give away, I think, a hundred dollars every to every open mic to whoever got you know the best applause, uh, which is kind of crazy if you think of what open mics are now, where people are trying to do them in laundromats in order right. to get time, you know. But they would give away a hundred bucks, and I remember uh, once watching like a uh, guy clearly win. Guy, this guy was clearly the winner, but this other dude had brought. 40 people with him and they cheered you know for him and so they gave it to the guy who got the most applause not the funniest and mm -hmm. everybody in the community has lost their minds like how dare you this injustice to the comedian <laughs> i just flashed on the the moment of saturday night uh, fever where the wrong the wrong uh, group uh, the wrong the wrong couple wins the award so so, I mean, it would be a nice, uh, if you really wanted to pursue this, because um, uh, so many movie themes have jumped in my head, the verdict, right? Where Paul would have been sure. Today, you know, we're searching for justice. You know, uh, to look at those moments, you know, those ideal moments where justice seems to be the resolution. Uh, well, that's like, the American storytelling of all the action heroism, right? It's all justice. Well, right, 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 and 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 the criteria for justice, you know, my old uh, shtick about um, uh, what 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 the dialectics of drama do is winnow their ways of treating these issues, right? And so, um, whereas uh, uh, yeah, we we have we have people in my old my old example before I got too old was kung fu, right? A man of complete peace who wants, but every episode he winds up kicking somebody in the face. Hmm. Um, and it is, so, so every episode basically uh, instructs us in what are the injustices, what are, what are the right reasons for transcending uh, the, uh, the, 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 the morality of, of, and, and doing violence. So whereas a, a pure man of peace uh, would only do this if, if we had met those criteria. So ultimately then, and, and I think mo we know that all drama really is centered around conflict and a, a huge part of these are centered around precisely these kinds of moral conflicts. Uh, the other example is the old Star Trek where we have a prime directive, don't interfere. The, you know, this is punishable by death. This is the most serious, every episode they break the rule, right? Right. Well, and so what we learn in every episode is what are the right reasons for breaking that ultimate rule? Um, and, and so we, this, this is how the, the drama goes about telling us what, what these values are, right? The values that transcend uh, uh, the, the, the stable morality. Well, if you're engaged, you know, just to kind of reel that in for a moment, if you're engaged in this same kind of uh, drama on a political scale, if you are a Trumpian and you believe that the greatest fear and the greatest travesty, the greatest threat to our society is liberal politics, and that certainly is how they've been instructed. Um, that, that is the mythos. Um, then for Trump to be hauled in on tax evasion, or right, whatever, whatever, so, or because he, he cheated on his, uh, you know, uh, evaluating how much his property was worth. Um, well, so on one side, you have this sort of litigious, literal 
uh, by the book, Notion of Justice. Oh, well, you broke the law. You should, you know. Um, on the other side, you have, wow, right? There's no, that's not justice. And of course, Trump comes out and says to those people, this is a, you know, it's a kangaroo court. This, this case should be dismissed. This I know. So you have two different codes of justice that are really being wrought here from two different orientations about what, what value should transcend, right? The, the code, okay? Um, and historically, we, what we have, society, you know, that everybody has evolved at the same time according to uh, these kinds of moralities um, and the secular morality of, of liberal justice and, and court systems and whatnot. Uh, runs headlong into a more um, historical uh, set of honor codes, right? Uh, and we find these kinds of conflicts culturally all the time. Uh, so uh, we have a very deep historical tradition uh, that, that's not in the courts, not in the legal system, not in written in books and rules uh, of what justice is. Uh, if you go back to the Greeks, it is really uh, you know, modified by your social role. Uh, you, you, you're you supposed to behave, if you're a king, you're supposed to behave kingly, right? <laughs> so what the, the, the good character of a king is different than the good character of a serf. Both must behave in accordance with their social role. And if you think about their, 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 their moral systems, right, we're, we're given these places in life and that we must enact them, right, with duty and justice. Um, so, uh, so, so if you're in a, the kind of orientation where you know, the world would work better if we had a king, if all of this stuff was invested in a, a, a one person's character, or if you're in uh, the, the, you know, the redemptive hero of, of Trump, uh, boy, there's, this is a huge injustice. And over here on the other side, oh, I caught you, I can write you a parking ticket for this, for this offense. Yeah, there, there's no connection here, right? So you have these, these, these bigger senses of ought that uh, an ethical being that are they're fundamentally in conflict and they're generationally in conflict and they're politically in conflict as the you know the what we would call the conservative movement is is trying to restore some sense of the past and this is exactly the kind of thing that these gradual student uh, grad graduate educated liberal people over here right uh, have, have been uh, keeping us down with so no, I think that's great. I think that, that especially bringing back the idea that there really are formal, and again, this is, I think, one of the things I love the most about rhetoric is that it comes into messes, informal human interaction, which are co incredibly complicated. It's like, hey, let's move this over here and see if we can add some formality to it to kind of clean it up so we can talk about it. And the idea of codes, you know, that we all live by a range of codes and we sort of move are moved and we move in and out of those codes. Like I remember being a professor teaching for so long, that code of you're supposed to look at people, you know, it's kind of like Burke's thing about not as evil, but as mistaken, you know, right. they're not, they're not stupid. They're just uneducated, you know, and that's very forgivable. Like I can handle that. Like I can't handle the other thing about looking at people as willfully, ignorant and uh, you know impervious to education that's no fun but the code of a professor and a teacher is you, you you're nice to those people as they learn as they mature as they evolve through something versus you get mad at them like you do when you drive around them you know like that person's the worst person ever and they should be you know okay. run off the road right now so i think that that idea of codes transcending situations and roles is super important in all of this well, it is the informal system of ethics, right? Uh, you know, how do, how do you know what is the right way to behave in, in any given situation? How are we instructed by culture in the right way to behave? And I think justice is part of that, right? Um, uh, that that uh, uh, trying to be, behave, you know, if you think about the golden rule, isn't that just a formula for justice, right? So uh, at any rate, um, uh, and so, but also how to repair errors. <clears throat> what are what are like we're talking about with with uh, you know what are the right what are the right criteria for for transcending the literal code of the law and breaking the law and uh, seeking a higher form of, of, of justice. 
Yeah, um, and going back to the action heroes, it's always when the law has failed to bring somebody to justice that you turn loose the vigilante with a higher sense of justice who's willing to make the sacrifice and physically execute this person. Oh, there is no doubt that, you know, once again, the American model myth, um, and, and it's the, the, it is the one story of our popular culture uh, over and over and over again in virtually every genre, uh, the superheroes, but the, the detective work, you know, uh, is, is the fundamental culture that, uh, and, and this, is, this is Trumpianism, uh, the fundamental belief that uh, societies are not capable of vanquishing evil by themselves. They're, they're, they're impotent. Uh, so, you know, we always begin with some sort of Midwestern town, everything's peaceful, and then evil invades somehow. The, the redeemer is always somebody from the outside because the system itself, the, the social system that maintains stability and calm and order cannot fight, cannot vanquish the evil. So it, we always have, right? So think about, it, you know, the, uh, certainly all science fiction and, and hero stuff uh, is of this nature. The character of a hero is always an outsider, right? Somebody, some, somebody with a, a, a mysterious moral past, whatever, who for whatever sets of reasons comes in and, and uh, sets things right for us because they're capable, they're powerful and can, can vanquish evil. Well, I think this is the drama being played out here, right? Um, but uh, that is, that is, that is uh, e e even, you know, like uh, the detectives that don't break all the rules and, and make their boss mad, they, they are not capable of fighting the bad guys. Just well, in almost is, every way we do this over and over and over again, right? And that is exactly the Trump business hero story. So he's got exactly. multiple characters he plays, but the business character is, I'm coming into the swamp, the political arena, and I'm applying all my business genius to you know clean this place up. You know, that's the Jared, you know, going to the Middle East and, well, we're going to send a guy, you know, who's not political and he's going to, like, do something. We're not going to tell you what it is, but he's been over there coming with a new business approach. He's a Harvard guy and he can figure out the Middle East, right? Yeah, I, I, I you know, just on a personal note, uh, this is the part I, I just can't ever figure out why anybody thinks that works. I, I, I understand. I understand the mistrust of the, the uh, organization. <laughs> I I can get so far with the trust of mistrust of government in general. I, I understand it anthropologically. I just don't see how anyone can convince themselves that any of this stuff has worked. <laughs> that's that's the well, hard part I think for it, me. It, but it, it to me what explains it is the idea. That it doesn't matter who the redeemer is, as long as it is an outsider is not following the same rules as the people inside that system that we know is broken. And so when Trump comes in as the billionaire, as the genius who is going to apply business stuff to this, even the idea of him breaking politics and not following rules of uh, institutional home, uh, you know, homage to this has been here for the State Department, has been here doing great work for, and he comes in and just tries to wipe it out. You know, that's right. a business move. I'm just shearing things off. I'm selling off the State Department. I don't care. I'm going to rip up these contracts with these allies. And that's just business moves. That's just basic, you know, business hero. But it's not justice. It's not ethics. So it doesn't really fit in that arena. But at least it's different. So I guess that's why he still gets the Redeemer, you know, hero cleanup rhetoric around it, at least. Uh, well, you know, I suppose uh, if, if once again, if you label the rest of that as corruption, then he is the or fixer. incompetence. Well, uh, sure. I mean, I, I, I do, I do buy that that uh, Burkean formula that you talked about. That that most of this is a matter of uh, human incompetence, not evil, uh, and that that comic view of things, I think, is the one we need to seize here. But it raises the question: When is evil invoked? Uh, as the warrant, right, uh, for these other, these more extreme forms of justice. And so every, anytime I hear that, you know, uh, so when, when, when are the times when we come out and say, we have seen evil, this is evil. Uh, and then, of course, the byproduct of all the demonization. Uh, so, uh, you know, once again, uh, we, we heard it loud and clear and plain after 911. We heard it loud and clear after October 7th. Uh, this is evil. Must be vanquished. We must. You know. You don't just 
you know, cut a deal with evil. You have to vanquish it. Right. right. For it to be for it to be justice, for it to, to actually right. fulfill well, the the emotional needs of the people who have been wronged. Well, yeah, it's, it's yeah, the catharsis here. Right. Exactly. Uh, it has to be it has to be stamped out somehow. So it, 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 you are already in a language of ultimates there. So in a way, you, you've already transcended the system of justice, which isn't going to yield those sorts of things. It's going to yield a system of compromises, things we can live with. Uh, mediating between contradictions, which well, you know, we've seen this but, but, but when you're dealing with the language of ultimate, the contradictions are everywhere, uh, right? The contradictions are everywhere, and uh, we live with them because we must, because we stay in that frame of, of ultimate sacrifice. When you see even in the the rhetoric of justice within the courts for Trump, every person is subjected to the laws of America, no matter what level you're at, right? And the president comes along and you see this rhetoric of he's not a person anymore, he's an office and you can't, you can't, you know, indict him for any crime, which people have a real hard time with, with sort of the, again, because they're wrapped in the sense of American justice that we will eventually get to the evil. We will eventually kill off the, the dictators and you know we will eventually win which is the story that we tell ourselves over and over and over and over and so i see it on the left where people are like yeah trump eventually is going to get excised he's going to be held accountable in some way i, I don't know like but it goes back to the original what we started with is that sense that you're living with outrage because your justice system doesn't work well, sure. I mean, okay, on the one side, you have people saying, no, this this principle should reign here. No person is above the law. And then you have the the the, uh, the masses saying, yeah, tell me that again. <laughs> right? How, 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 how dear is that? I mean, if you've lived at the bottom of society all along, um, uh, do, is that is that really what you think the truth is that that no person is above the law, right? So uh, you know, well, they're even dragging up OJ, right? Okay, the OJ tried. <laughs> I haven't heard. Like, this, but... I've seen this where they're talking about you know, well, Trump's a rich guy, he's a celebrity. They don't get held to account, and it's just another example of that. Remember all the outrage wars that kind of went back and forth from different groups like a pinball about the the unjust the injustice of that verdict versus you know like some people were like i find that a very just verdict based on you know historical conditions for a black man in this culture well you know and and, and once again i i think ultimately uh all this is kind of swimming around in in confusion for People having this the, the kind of categories uh, uh, will Trump receive the same justice as anybody else? Clearly not. Already not the case. Uh, you want to be the first guy to sentence him to jail? <laughs> you want you want you want to be there when this happens, right? Um, so even though he may be looking at, at a, a lot of uh, technical, you know, uh, actionable. Uh, 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 legal cases, um, ult ultimately, the resolution of these things probably is not going to be the same it would be for anybody else. And that, that seems to be a tacit understanding of the system going into it, right? It, well, it's almost reported every day. Gosh, if a standard, if a regular person would have talked to the judge this way, he'd be spending right. the night. They were even evoking my cousin, Benny, I think, as... <laughs> When you say this to the judge, you go to, you know, spend the night in jail. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, one of our major literary instructive traditions, uh, my cousin Vinny, for the, uh, the the justice, the proper justice route. I think of the verdict <laughs> a lot. Like that movie, it really is that kind of sense of catharsis because they won, right? They got justice for this person in the form of extra money. And even at the end, when it's like, when they give them that Hollywood, which is the genius of Hollywood, you get more than what you asked for when you are the, you know, when you stay true to your, you know. Right, but once again, it is, it, is another, it is another version of the monomyth and the, and, the, and the Kung Fu thing 
the jury, uh, the, the judge is corrupt, right? And the jury ignores the judge's instruction uh, to not count that testimony. Uh, they, we all know it's the truth. And that's, there is, there is that moment uh, also in my cousin Vinny. Oh, go ahead. They all know already, right? That we all, we already know what the truth is because it's been dramatized by experts in our lives, right? Uh, so we've already, we've already arrived at the truth and then the legal system is itself corrupt and going to favor the rich guy and the powerful guy. And the heroic moment there is throwing off the, the law, throwing off the rules and, and uh, right. And giving pure, a purer justice. You know, not a rule-based justice, but a and, and I think, justice. I think the OJ drama for many people is exactly that. Yeah, we have the DNA evidence, right, from a scientific clinical uh, point of view, but but from a point of view of, of the of the jury um, and the story that got told there, no, right. Well, and again, one of the things you can do rhetorically with this is sort of run up and down what I call the mega pico scale. So down here is the very, you know, precise thing like, well, this this person got a slight burn on their little finger. You know, what's the justice for that versus this cosmological scale of justice? You know, well, humanity always suffers like these things happen again and again and again. You can't fix it with the concept of justice. There's always, you know, it's the universe is unjust, like every every. 50, 80 million years or whatever, the entire planet gets destroyed, all life gets killed, and has to start again. If you just move up that scale, it becomes a very interesting rhetoric about where do we land in order to finally make a decision. So like Trump is going to pay a price, you know, you've seen this, like when he dies, like I guess God's going to have to, you know, punish Trump. <laughs> well. That, that may that may that may help some people. I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but sure, there, that is that is an ultimate consolation. Is uh, it's only it's only uh, God's uh, uh, domain to be able to settle all these things. So we 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 this is a way of letting go. This is a way of well, letting like go. the movie Ghost. Remember, you know, it, it's it, it, total injustice. His best friend ends up getting him murdered, and he's in this perfect life with this with this woman. And then, like when they die now, you get to see the the shadows pull the evil people down into hell, right. and like you're like, oh wow, that's such a nice, intense piece of justice. Well, you know, and once again, I think I think what, that that is that sense of justice and fittingness and closure is what we seek in right uh, uh, back to Oedipus, right? Uh, that, that what 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 balances us out in the end. Is, is precisely what that dialectic does. And the dialectic of the court system is another way of, of achieving that sort of thing. Uh, and they're all, so, you know, you talked about this, this scale. Uh, in fact, that was one of the very first sort of software programs uh, for law. It was called the status doctrine, right? So what is the status? We have a status of what is the level of fact? And then the next is what is the level of quality? What is the quality of the act? So it's a way of, of going through that set of, of tiers of finding the, the proportional, right? The proportional punishment for the crime. Um, how much guilt, what kind of guilt? So that's all been worked through by you know, thousands of years of precedence uh, as, we, uh, as we go you know, in, in this kind of hierarchical uh, scale of things. So yeah, all of that stuff has been worked through uh, uh, in, in, in great gradient and degree. Yeah, and it's funny when you try to teach people argument in everyday life, you know, and I'm like, your evidence, like you don't understand the what evidence is. Like, look at the rules of evidence. And I send this right. to people sometimes, like just the courtroom rules of evidence and try to read it. Like it's like 18 pages of just minutia of how you judge evidence. Right. And yet you as a human being are just flying through claims and evidence, you know, from sources you don't even know where it came from, and yet you expect to reach some type of true out, outcome. You know, I'm like, the reason why it slows down, courts slow things down so much, is because human life is so complicated, you know? And if you're gonna make a judgment about something eventually, you, you talked about divorces, you know, there's, it's universal that if you go on online dates after you've been divorced, 
And at some point, the conversation turns around to, you know, why'd you get divorced? And you start talking bad about your ex. It's universal that the other person would be like, well, I'm sure you had no part in it at all. <laughs> they call you to task. Right, right, right. right. Well, and then, you know, the other thing that I thought of as you were talking, uh, uh, we do have this sort of, you know, incredibly worked out system for qualifying, uh, uh, compensating, uh, assessing, finding proportional. But, uh, you know, I thought about being a parent. How many, how many judgments of justice do you make in terms of, of getting your children through school, through life, through interactions with other people, through romantic, you know? Uh, there's, there's also the the you know choose your battles scale the the um, uh, let it pass um, that that we're not going to there's not going to be justice to be had here or the you know the process is not uh, worth the uh, right the redress is not worth the the, the, the crime so uh, there you have, one has to learn this informal system of letting it go just you know and I guess I guess the ultimate of that is the kind of the kung fu model of pacifism where where I don't have control over all these things society doesn't have control over there is a greater scale out there somewhere um, well and like, like you said you know the turn up the quality of your consolation your consoling of of uh, someone like and you do this with kids a lot where you're like okay let me expand your view here sure. yes there was injustice that you experienced in the greater scale this is like in your bottom 0. 0.0006 percent Right. You've got much bigger injustices coming your way. Trust me. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Uh, so, yeah, you know, it's just one other one of these fascinating things where the judgment processes that we go through um, a, a bazillion times and, and they're guided by multiple and conflicting codes um, uh, and processes. And so, you know, there, there's all, all, all the splits, public and private, class, history all of those things come to bear and, and, and every every instance here uh is complex and ultimately what resolves all these things you know ult ultimately is not uh, a sense that everybody's going to be satisfied with that an answer was found and that the you know perpetuating the conflict will only be more costly than letting it go yeah i think that's where we get stuck these days because social media and cable media and you know all the things that have ha that have allowed the other voices up into the higher echelon of the discussion so it used to be yes maybe the two warring combatants decide we can live with this amount of land gone and and that's it we're done but then it turns out you know there're a million people living in that slice of land that they get to decide are are we ukrainian are we russian are we something else are we you know, and now they have ability to stay in the discussion. They don't simply become silent again and accept the what's been handed and doled out. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that what blows people away, and I've done some work on this lately. We'll have to talk about it in a future episode. Like with the wokeism and the way it's been used, this idea of, you know, it's an injustice to a group. And what's the redress? The fact is now they've got new forms of redress that force this issue to boil up in a much more multiple, complicated way. So whereas before two combatants come together in a court, work it, nobody's happy, but we're done with that one. Let's move on to the next fight. They don't leave that fight. Like I'm not done here. And they've got some communication ability to drag it back over. Right. Well, ultimately, these things we involve, there has to be some level of agreement on the system of redress, right? So we have to agree to abide by the decision of the court. This is, this is the thing you sign when you go on Judge Judy. Whatever else you think at the end of it, you're going to, you're going to abide by the decision here. Uh, the GOP so doesn't we, do that. Like, look, what just did, that well, look what they just did with Hunter Biden. Like they made a, The court made a decision like, nope, we're going to replace everybody and do it again. <laughs> um but you know, back and, and this was this is a topic of conversation right now. What happens when there is no agreement that we will accept the results of an election? Uh, you know, Steve Bannon is out there saying uh, there, there, that that there's nothing left here but the MAGA movement, and we must continue to 
uh, denying the outcomes of these elections. So one side is not agree. You know, once again, they're, they're, we only have conflict as a way of resolving, you know, power when when those kinds of levels of agreement uh, to uh, accept the the uh, results of any sort of process uh, evaporate. Um, and some people, and what happens when some people are there? So that is that is exactly, I think, what gets coded in all these conversations about, you know, democracy being in danger. We we must agree that democracy is the resolution here, and that is the only thing that keeps it going. Right. Yeah, I mean, there is so arbitrary justice, arbitrary codes, all these things that we agree to that have been arbitrarily boiled up as options. Ultimately, something has to be resolved. Like you have to agree that, yeah, this is what democracy is like, like that elections, free and fair elections, you move on to the next election. If you want to fight again, great. But if you have a party that's like, oh, we can hack into the system. That's essentially all MAGA has done. And the entire, you know, kind of authoritarian movement sees those systems in place. Oh, they've made all these agreements. I can hack into this right here because it's a stable system. And when you get hackers like that, like the Putin propaganda machine and the you know MAGA kind of blockade within the government machine and all these things they do, then it's just constantly breaking. So all the agreements that we've had aren't gonna work. So, you know, do you pull up a, is that like, and I've tried to do this a lot. I'm like, that's just, that's an unjust act to deny the system that we've created for justice. Sure. Right. Like, but how do you get how do you do how do you assign blame and criminality or corruption and make it stick if there's no system? Fighting it out. Then you go to war, I guess. <laughs> and I and I guess that's why there is a mysticism of war that, that somehow there are greater forces fighting and uh, right on, on after these sides. Right. Well, in the system now, like even war has changed though. War doesn't end any, anything. Like, okay, you won the war, this side uh, surrendered, but there's all these people on that side that have not surrendered. And they've Whoa. got enough capacity now with new type of weaponry and, you know, all this stuff. Like even Palestine, that's like, oh, we've got this settled. Nah, Hamas is like, no, nah, I don't think you do. <laughs> not, not, not so much, right? Not so much, exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, and when we were just a bunch of tribes running around the jungle and, and you know, these wars did go on, uh, they, they, they never, because, you know, once again, when something bad happens, it, uh, uh, we're talking about just the, the, the given of suffering and loss in life, right? Uh, that the, the instant repair is it's the, right, it's the actions of some evil, right, some, some, some uh, uh, other party, right? Uh, either inside the inside the tribe or from without, so you know how to act. You know how to act against these 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 losses. Uh, how to how to resolve against these sufferings. Um, but you know when you're in when you're in an age of world war and you know the the amount of devastation that that war disables people's ability to continue. Th then we had to figure out something else. <laughs> Which has kind of been the challenge of the last hundred years, basically. Uh, and now that you know that agreement seems to be wearing a bit thin. Um, and ultimate powers and ultimate authorities are really the only thing that have been backing that. Um, and uh, and a lot of that has been sort of the, the you know America. So that doesn't mean that that other sides haven't been you know keep keeping track of their grievances. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, there you go. I think we've complicated the soup. Well, it is a complicated soup. I think that's the whole point. Is that that uh, you know, I, I, to me, the, the 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 moment that we came to there though is that what happens if there are certain actors for whom only creating chaos and um, making it more complicated it serves their their cause, right? And, and this to me is the the current the current villain. Uh, is uh, uh, we're only we're only here to to mess up the system. We're only here to, and I suppose that I don't, I don't hear in that some greater resolution down the road. I don't hear in that a greater vision for how this resolves into a better, a more perfect union. 
a more perfect system, a greater justice for humans, a greater survival. I don't hear any of that. I just hear such misery um, with where it is that, that we want to foul it. And, you know. So there's no doubt that, that that kind of propaganda can create chaos, uh, can disable our systems um, and, 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 make it, and make it always all a street fight, right? That, that's kind of, when, you know, when systems aren't working or we don't have the ability to take stock of where they do work. I think a lot of it is a dysfunction of our interpretive systems where there, there's no rhetoric out there saying, look at what's working here. You know, there, there's absolutely, you know, well, and, and there's, Biden a, there's right a ton now, of right? stuff working. Uh, there's I mean, Biden's of... diplomacy, you know, the fact that he's trained in diplomacy and he's trained, super trained in getting legislation passed. Those things have actually worked during the Biden administration, but nobody is recognizing that because they don't, it's not even a category anymore. <laughs> well, you know, I, I had a moment, uh, I, I think with the news yesterday when, uh, the, the, the headline of, so, of the moment was, the, the, the crawl of the moment was, uh, uh, voters don't believe Biden in Bidenomics. And I'm kind of going, you know, somebody articulate for me what Bidenomics are. It is simply the presence of an economic theory against the lack of one whatsoever, right? right. There, there's, there's absolutely no economic theory on the other side of what works and what doesn't work. It's not even the old Republican uh, saws, right? I mean, Trump spent more money than than anybody um, uh, unrestrainedly. And you even hear Democrats or uh, Republicans admitting that up front, uh, Santos and Haley and others. Uh, so, there, you know, it, it's just that, the, so, so Bidenomics just means that the sense being employed here, there is no particular unique, as far as I know, uh, economic policy that to contrast with some other, it is simply the presence of, gee, math works versus, what the hell? Spend it on anything. So uh, you know, uh, the the point being is that 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 the, that the, the default here seems to be just utter uh, insanity and, and nonsense. And uh, well, maybe that's and, and, and it breeds dissatisfaction. And there's power in that for a certain number of people right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's the chaos makers are having their day, without a doubt. Like these institutions are not being used to attack being attacked at this level in these ways. And the the always on attack, no matter what, singular good versus greater good, they, they're having their day for sure. Now the question is like, the way you disentangle that, to me it, it, on a mega level, it sort of goes back to the death of Logos, you know, the lockup of Logos, like trying to detangle this Uber entangled environment is a logical action and it's a rational process. And therefore, like the big, the Biden thing, he still plays rationality. He's like, well, if we put this policy in place, it has these outcomes. So we should probably have that. And the chaos makers are like, just jump in there and just chew on every piece of the bone to stop it. And there's power in that, clearly. It's not a out for the greater good or a just society or anything like that. It's just a power grab. So to me, like the rational response to that is you have to isolate those chaos makers and be like, oh, look, here's the history of start with, go back to Gingrich. And here's the Congress, here's the chaos makers playbook. And anytime you see this, I don't know, we have to have rhetorical guardians of the galaxy to come in and say, no, you can't do that technique. Like you can't do that one. Like the gag order is an amazing idea for Trump. He got a gag order from Twitter, you know, at one point. We're like, no, nope, we're taking you down. And it was so much silence that sort of way that broke across America and the world because he had been given a, a communication rule, you know, that wasn't in place before. It's like, if you talk like this, you will be removed from this platform. And to me, that kind of rhetorical guidelines and guardrails I guess that's what we've got to offer. It's like we can harden some of that. So it'd be like, hey, if you have chaos makers in your system, here's some rhetorical rules for dealing with those people. Right. Well, it seems to me just within the political realm that, you know, uh, there were people, there, there, there were systems in place in Congress, in both the Senate and the House to uh, 
you know, sideline these people to, uh, you, could, you could silence them, you could marginalize them, you could keep this at a minimum. Um, and, and the question is why, why isn't that working? And the only answer I could offer at the moment is uh, this sort of direct connection, you know, it, it's a media phenomenon. <clears throat> The direct connection with the voters, uh, you know, and that seems ultimately democratic. I guess the part of the problem here is that the, the body politic isn't quite there. That there, there's there's enough there's enough um, uh, franchise there to, uh, uh, you know, and this 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 last sort of struggle of power in the House of Representatives, I think, is a good good example. Uh, that we only have ten guys that are really on ten people who are really on this extreme. Uh, but that is sufficient to ultimately disable the system. Um, or over in the Senate, you know, Tuberville stopping the entire, you know. So, when, so did, clear, when did democracy so get the, that? When did democracy allow that much power to, <laughs> uh, you know, in one flake? Like it's never been used that way before, right? That's why I say the chaos makers have hacked into the demo democracy machine. It's like, oh, this little nut over here that y'all didn't think anybody'd ever use, and they just crank it. So we, we have not adjusted to that. We do not know. Right. What's so, so all of those things previously depended upon an informal consensus and an etiquette um, and, a, and a system, an alternative, not a codified system of power um, that made those things work. Right? Yeah, very lightly codified. And, and now uh, the, the process of conflict is able to disrupt those. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, ultimately there could be a better a better system that, that grows out of this if there's enough consensus. The question is, where do you get, you know, where do you get the warrant to do that? When, 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 do, when have people lost enough that they, that they rejoin this? And I don't know that history offers much encouragement here. It doesn't. No, I, totally. <laughs> it doesn't. But I mean, I just, I don't care. I'll just kind of, I'm going to keep holding up rhetoric as like a, a ship coming in over here, like, you know, like a uh, Gandalf coming in from, the fourth morning on a white, you know, now he's, and he's got the troops behind him. He's like, let us come in and clean some of this up for you. Like even gatekeeping, you know, the fact that on a national scale, there used to be gatekeepers to get to like the national news and that kind of stuff. And now the gatekeepers have just gone away. And you see like Elon Musk being the gatekeeper onto Twitter. You're like, what is that? Like who designed that as a rhetorical option? Like they've just grabbed the controls of things. We need to re-grab those controls back and be like, let's do a little gatekeeping. True. Well, I think I think that is that is the environment in which rhetoric and thinking about rhetoric flourishes. It was true, you know, in, in times of, of cultural relativity, relativity and change. Um, it's when when this comes to the fore because the truth is not, you know, uh, the the consensus is not out there. It's all up for grabs, and so perception and and consensus and right uh, an emergence, uh, and so here is a way of looking at the world that that uh, honors and deals with those contingencies, and says here's here's how it ultimately right uh, it, it 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 wins one way or another way. So I, I think that's that's a natural that you would uh, um, be be reading those signs and responding in that way. But once again, history. Uh, his, his, his history uh, can tell us that you know things can get pretty bad before they <laughs> before they redress. Right. Yeah. Before anybody's like, you know what? Maybe we're not qualified to do this. Why don't y'all fix it? Because we are. We've just made it too much of a mess of it. Too many people are suffering. Yeah. So. Well, uh, I appreciate you jumping on. You know, from uh, your eight month odyssey out of Florida. All right, the coast right. of Savannah, back to Atlanta. You got a knee surgery coming up. You 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 were you jumped right in and played rhetoric of justice. Well, uh, I, I guess these kinds of messes are my uh, my forte, huh? But, uh... Yeah, I think I, the rhetoric of failure stuff. I think you know the idea of consolation because you're not going to get a perfect outcome. You know, these ideas are perfect for this this uh, type of situation, and they're they're very useful for people if they get them that cleanly. Yeah. Well, one one can help. Anyway, thanks for bringing me on. I All respect. right. I'll I'll catch up with you guys again later. And who knows where you'll be? All right. Talk soon. Okay. See you.